from the MZ Studios Dallas Virtual Studios in cyberspace. This is Deconstructing Dallas. Greetings, everyone. It's your host, Ryan Trimble, coming to you once again by the miracle of the interweb, joined again by the ever-patient Sean P. Williams. Sean, good day, sir. Hey, Ryan Trimble. How are you, man? I'm doing well. I, I say patient because I think it was, oh, I don't know, April when you pinged me, you know, when we first brought the podcast back and, and thanks to our friend Michael Zavala at MZ Studios, uh, virtual studios in cyberspace. Um, you were like, are you watching The Last Dance? And I got all my buddies pinging me like, oh my gosh, did you see this episode week after week after week? And homeschool dad problems over here. It was like, no, I haven't. I haven't. And I put it off and I finally put the craft projects away one night and I dove right in. And I was laughing to myself because there's our friend, the great Rick Carlisle, full head of hair, Rick Carlisle. I think it was episode two or three, Sean. And he's, you know, getting dunked on by a young Michael Jordan. So, uh, love it. Recommend it to everybody. Um, you know, that's, uh, (laughs) <laughs> that hasn't seen it yet. So well, that, everybody hadn't been, yeah, hadn't been teaching. I haven't seen it. <laughs> oh er, yeah. Everybody hadn't been teaching, you know, space lessons yes. and, uh, you know, running uh, a, a home school and, you know, checking out episodes of Paw Patrol. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I definitely knew that you would get around to it. Yeah. I'm glad that you did. And I tell you, there is another gem besides the awesome filmmaking Besides the awesome memes uh, that include Michael Jordan listening to music on the bus, and also, <laughs> also, uh, there's a meme of Isaiah Thomas when he talked about that he had the the credentials to make the Olympic team, but he wasn't selected. Um, but also, there is an awesome The Last Dance Spotify um, playlist, oh, and it, nice. it it has all the music that they played through all 10 episodes and it's a whole lot of 90s hip hop um and 90s 90s rock a little grunge as well so i would i would encourage anyone with a spotify account to check out the last dance playlist yes mrs trimble is definitely grooving to some of the uh songs i saw her over on the couch as she was <laughs> taking a break from from covid response and and <laughs> jamming out so it was fun it was but it's, you know we 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 over there are two and a half now years of doing this show. We have talked plenty of hoops. Uh, we talk SMU hoops. We talk Dallas hoops. And we've got a special guest tonight coming on. And by the way, we are recording at night. I believe this is the latest <laughs> that we've ever recorded our show. But um, our guest tonight is coming to us from the NBA. That's right. She, of course, uh, the the th- only the third woman to be an assistant coach in the NBA. She, of course, Jenny Busick uh, of the Dallas Mavericks. Well, we um, had an opportunity through our one of our owners, Jennifer Pascal, sent us an email. And she was like, you know, I talked to uh, one of the coaches for the Mavs, Jenny Busick. Would you guys um, like to interview? And I think it took me all of 30 seconds to respond. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm not please. sure how many oh, exclamation yes. marks <laughs> I had uh, on that response that I had. But I, I do remember going to a game in December and looking out and I, I guess I just kind of missed it, but I looked on the floor and you know how the coaches, they go <clears throat> to the free throw line uh, during the timeouts and do their strategy before they come back to the team. And I saw that there was a female coach, which I just didn't realize. And I said, Oh my God, the Mavericks, I did not, this is something that I just missed. I thought that uh, I still thought that the, uh, the Spurs were still the only team that had a female coach, but you know, again, as we'll talk to coach, uh, if you know the game, you know the game. So it's, it's going to be a, a really exciting conversation. Jenny was hired in 2018. Coach Busick was hired in 2018 by the Mavericks. And there's a great interview uh, that, I, that I'm that i going to have to ask her about. She, she goes on Outside the Lines with Bob Lee on ESPN, the great bearded Bob Lee. And, uh, and, and Bob says, now your whole family's with you at, at the studio where you're recording and you – let me get this straight. You're going straight to the hospital to give birth right after this interview. And, and it's, it's just an amazing, uh, uh, you know, she, she's happy, overjoyed, nervous, excited. It's, it's really great. Um, 
I wanted to play this clip just to get a sense uh, of Jenny Busick. And I am joined now by Jenny Busick. I usually ask my guests how they're doing. It has a, an extra level of meaning. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's an exciting day. As, as you know, I'm on my way to the hospital. <laughs> we, we are recording this interview Monday afternoon. So when we finish our conversation, you're going to deliver the baby? Yes, that's right. Um, because of my back injury from my playing career, uh, they're choosing to do a C-section. So we're heading to the hospital right after this. So you've got yeah. your, your family in tow and, and everyone's there, the whole support network. Yes, this is a team effort. So the <laughs> part of the team is here. So we're, we're well taken care of, oh. but I know I can, I can use all the help I can get. <laughs> oh, that, that, that is great. Sean, I love that clip because you, you can tell she's excited, but you can also tell the excitement and the joy that she has that the Mavericks, uh, you know, have, have given her this chance to not only uh, pursue her, you know, her career, but also to be a mother. Um, it's, it's really cool. I think it speaks volumes to the organization, you know, that, that we, we, we know because we see them, you know, in action here in town. And uh, I think it's just, a, it's a great testimony to, um, you know, what kind of people Rick Carlisle and, and Mark Cuban Sent Marshall and, and everybody, you know, at the Mavs, uh, what kind of people they are. Well, yeah, we've heard a lot of great things from the Mavericks over the last uh, few weeks. And, and the organization has just been so proactive. So it's really not a surprise uh, that they would make this basketball move, right? Because this is a basketball move. Um, someone who's got a lot of great experience uh, in the in the WNBA, in the NBA, in, in college. So uh, I'm excited. So as soon as we come back from this break, we're going to talk to Dallas Mavericks assistant coach Jenny Busick. This is Deconstructing Dallas. Brian Trimble, Sean Williams. We'll be right back right after this. Welcome back, Deconstructing Dallas. Ryan Trimble, Sean Williams. Sean, I'm super fired up. We've got a great guest today. She, of course, the third female coach in the history of the NBA. She, the great Jenny Busick. Jenny, welcome to the show. Great to be here, guys. I can't imagine a better way to spend my Thursday night. Why not? Why not? That's exactly how we feel. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jenny, for those... Um, for for those of our listeners who who aren't familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit, little bit about yourself and your background and how you got into basketball? Uh, yeah, well, it's it has been an, an unexpected journey. You know, I played everything growing up and uh, come from a very academic family that wasn't even going to let me play a sport in college. Um, so I was looking at colleges not not based on sports um, and narrowed it down to to ten schools and then started getting recruited in tennis first, then then volleyball. And then lastly, basketball. Um, it was not my best sport, but it was my favorite by far. And uh, and down the stretch, I ended up getting recruited by University of Virginia, who was number one in the nation at the time in women's basketball. Um, but they were also number one on my list before I'd even looked into the athletic side of things. So it was a win-win for me. And I had a great experience there. And then the year that I graduated, um, the WNBA began. So my plans to go to med school got thwarted and, uh, ended up playing in the WNBA. Um, and then that, that plan kind of got thwarted because the first game that I earned a starting spot about a month in as a young rookie, I broke my sacrum. And, uh, that was, that was pretty much the end of my career. I played overseas in Iceland to try to come back, but my core was just jacked up. And, uh, and so it wasn't meant to be for me. Uh, but the, the, the purpose of the WNBA and the potential of the WNBA, uh, being a part of that inaugural season really gripped my heart. You know, I saw, um, what it could be and what it meant to people. You know, we didn't have a professional sports league for women at that time. And so to see grown women at our games in full tears, um, to see young girls at our games, like almost confused and perplexed to see women 
doing something that, that they'd never seen before and just seeing the little light bulbs go on in their little minds of what it represented for opportunities for them and seeing young little boys at our games looking up to us and wearing our jerseys and thinking, you know, there's a generation of young men that are going to grow up with a different paradigm about women that could help their marriages and them as fathers, et cetera. So like I said, it really, it really just felt like that league mattered and I wanted to be a part of helping get it off the ground and be a good situation for players. And so that's the first time I contemplated coaching. Um, and I got into coaching in 1999 with the Washington Mystics. I was only like 23, 24 years old and was coaching players on our team up to 40 years old. So that was an interesting uh, experience just being such a young coach in a, in a very veteran league when it began. Um, but I, I learned a lot about, you know, leadership and my particular leadership style that really has, um, you know, been my foundation. So I coached in the WNBA 20 plus years and was with several great organizations and uh, had some great, great, great mentors, including Ron Rostein down in Miami when the Miami Heat had a women's team. He's a 40-year-plus uh, NBA vet, and he was mentoring – he ended up mentoring, mentoring me as well as Eric Spolstra, who's like my coaching brother. We're in the fa- same family tree in, in the coaching world. And that, without me realizing, was going to come full circle, um, him laying the foundation – in my, my life, you know, coaching wise and becoming like my coaching father, uh, really equipped me for when this opportunity came to coach in the, in the NBA a few years ago, uh, over in Sacramento. So it's been an interesting journey, not planned. I had never had any long-term goals for any of this, um, never aspired for any of this. It just, this is, this is the way the path has gone. And so now here I am, I'm in Dallas and, uh, and trying to do big things here. So, so you, um, went, during your time in the WNBA in 2015, you were named the coach of the head coach of the Seattle Storm. And so I, I'd like to know a little bit about your head coaching career. Also, the fact that you were the head coach for the great Sue Bird. Yeah. That, I mean, that was obviously a treat. You know, I, I've, I've coached a lot of great players and I'm very, very, very thankful for that. You know, to, to witness greatness, to be around greatness, to be a part of greatness, their journey. You know, Sue, I've been coaching off and on since 2003 um, because I was I was there as an assistant coach when we won our first championship. Sue was very young and we won our first one in 2004. And then we won another one together in 2010 with a whole different ownership group. Sonics were gone. New ownership group, new coach. um, And then we you know, then they just won another one in 2017, I believe. 17 or 18. I'd have to look at the, the year, but I was already in the NBA, but, but I was a part of, of building that, that championship team and the rebuild with that team. So Sue and I have a lot of history. Um, and it, she's a great friend of mine and I've learned so much from her and that's been a huge blessing. But, you know, I've coached, I've been fortunate to coach a lot of great players, a lot of great young ones, a lot of great veteran ones. Um, and I think any coach that's been around, the greatest of the greats, you know, will tell you, you learn a lot or as much or more from them as as they learn for you by far. Now in 2017, then you make the jump from the WNBA to the NBA and in Sacramento, tell us about that transition and and what it was like to be, I mean, truly you're a pioneer, uh, you know, you're a trailblazer in, in coaching. So what, what was that like? Well, you know, you don't, you don't see it like that. I don't think, you know, I think for, for us, um, women who are now coaching in in the NBA, um, you know, we're just doing what we love. And when we get an opportunity to coach at, at different places, you know, I don't see the NBA as better than the WNBA. Um, you know, I have too much respect for, for the women to say that, you know, but the, the difference is just the doors just haven't been open. And, uh, and I always tell people, you know, we don't want to get jobs because we're a woman, not, not by any means. Uh, we don't want this to be a trend. Um, I, I would be insulted by that. But the fact that for for the most of the existence of the NBA, you could not get an interview because you're a woman. So we don't want a job because we're women. We just don't want to not get a job or an opportunity because we're a woman. And for most of the the league's history, that's that was the case. Um, so it's it's good to see that that now people are opening up their minds a little bit to a different talent pool. Um, and some some more diversity because I think there's beauty and and value and diversity of all types, and you see a lot. 